Right. Good morning, Grace Church. How's everybody doing? Yeah? We got a whistle over here. We got a good over here. You guys doing all right? Good, good. Hey, my name is Dan. I'm the campus pastor here. If we have not had the chance to meet, uh, I would love uh, to meet you. If it's your first time with us, second time with us, you're fairly new uh, to the Grace community, welcome. We're so happy uh, to have you. If you are watching and joining us online, whether it's live or on Facebook or Instagram or MySpace, is that a thing anymore? Um, Hey, we just want to say to you, welcome as well. Go ahead and share this, comment. We want to know that you're watching. We want to know where you're watching from. And and like I said, share this. I believe that God's got something that he wants to to speak to somebody this morning. Hey, we're going to go ahead and jump in here in just a a minute, but if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. Go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll have uh, one of our ushers bring you a Bible. As usual, uh, most of our verses are going to be up here on the screen, but we want to make sure that if you want a Bible, you've got one in your hand. And we definitely want to put the most important thing first. And so if you do have your Bible uh, with you, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. If you've got a house Bible, it's five, page 566. Uh, if you don't have a house Bible, I- I'm not psychic. I don't know what page it's on, but it's Galatians 1. It would be before Galatians 3, after Galatians 1. So you'll find it right there, right in the middle. And also, too, uh, if you want to follow along like with our notes, uh, you can go ahead and download our app if you don't already have it. We've got our notes and our sermon outline in there as well. But before we get started, let's go ahead and bow our heads, shall we? Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing each and every one of us here this morning. God, we just pray that uh, no matter where each and every one of us are at, that we would uh, just open our hearts, God, to your word. God, that it would be your words to speak through me, God, that it would not be mine. God, that you would be glorified and that you would show us as we continue to dive into the life of Peter and what it means to be split, God. You would show us where we're split. You would show us, God, where there are gaps in our character, Father. We love you and we thank you and we ask these things in your name. Amen. So I think that it's safe to assume that most of us, if not all of us, we try and do the right thing on a regular basis, right? Can I, can I get a hand that says like, yeah, you know what? Like I try. I try to do what's right. Whether you follow Jesus or not this morning, you always try to, to make the wisest decisions that you possibly can, right? And sometimes the intention is there, and the motive is there, and we make the right decision. But other times, the intention is there, and the motive is there, but the action maybe just doesn't quite follow, right? We try to do the right thing, but we end up doing the wrong thing. We end up making the wrong choice, the wrong decision, right? Even with the good intentions, even with the good motives. But let's take that one step further. Have you ever made a decision with the wrong motive in mind, with the wrong intention? Have you intentionally ever made a poor decision? Go ahead and raise your hand if you've done that before. Keep your hand down if you're lying, Uh, because we've all done this. We've all done this, whether we want to admit it or not. We have all made decisions out of the wrong motive. We've allowed the wrong thing to drive our decision-making, right? Each and every one of us has done that. Maybe it's frustration, anger, jealousy, something like that, right? Or maybe it's people-pleasing, right? People-pleasing is something that a lot of people do. My wife, she's not uh, a people pleaser per se, uh, but, but she, there's an area that she likes to please people in, and, and that's when we're trying to decide like somewhere to eat. Now, before you think I'm throwing my wife under the bus, like calling her a people pleaser, she told me to actually use this example, so like it wasn't my idea, this was hers. But if we're going out to eat with someone, we're going out with friends or whatever, she does not want to pick. She doesn't want to choose, right? Because she wants everybody to be happy, and if, if she wants pokey, but everybody else wants Mexican, she doesn't want to say pokey because everybody else maybe wants Mexican food, right? She does this when it's just her and I as well. She doesn't doesn't like to pick where we go. And so here's what I've done. I've learned like this little trick that works, right? If you have a a friend or a spouse or whatever who does this, here's what you do. You say, look, instead of me asking my wife, where where do you want to go for dinner tonight? I don't ask that question. You know what I ask? I ask, hey, guess where I'm taking you for dinner tonight, right? The first place she says, that's where I take her right? Boom. Problem solved. Now, before you start thinking, before you start thinking, oh, wait, did, did Pastor Dan just say, did, ta- did Pastor Dan just say that he manipulates his wife? Let's leave. There's the door. Let's, oh, wait, wait. My wife knows I do this, okay? So who's manipulating who, right? Who's, who's using who here to get the food that they want, right? What about fear? 
Have you ever made a decision out of fear? Fear being the motive? Fear is one of those interesting emotions, one of those things that happens because we get the weird chemical things happen in our brains. We think we're doing the right thing, but all in all, like we're, we're usually not. And some of you might be thinking, no, no, I don't make decisions out of fear. Oh, okay, we've all been driving down the freeway at 80 miles an hour, right? We've got the tunes turned up, and all of a sudden we see a highway patrol. What happens? We let off the gas. We sit up straight, 10 and 2. We turn the volume down, right? We're no longer jamming to, to Justin Bieber. We're just, right? Whenever we see a cop, we drive like we've got a, a bunch of stolen goods in the trunk. I don't know what the deal is with that. But we all do that, and in that moment, the reason why we slow down is what? It's fear. Fear because we don't want to get pulled over. Fear because we don't want our insurance to go up. We don't want the ticket, right? The motivation is usually not that, hey, we should be driving the speed limit. It's the right thing to do. We're motivated by fear in those moments. And we've all done this. We've all made decisions out of fear or out of worry. Those motives drive us. And there are cases in our lives that the motive of doing what is right drives us. But a lot of times we tend to make decisions or we can tend to make decisions out of negative emotions and negative feelings. You see, this is the gap that exists in our character. Okay, the gap between who we are and who Jesus has called us to be. That's the gap that we see. And sometimes when we get motivated by these things, we're doing it because we think that the root of it is something that is, that is good, right? We want to please people. We want to uh, bring happiness and joy to ourselves or to our family or whatever the case may be. My kids, all they want is sugar. And my, my oldest son, Jad, he literally asks for sugar. He doesn't say, can I have a cookie? Can I have some ice cream? Can I have this? Can I have that? He's like, daddy, can I have some sugar? Right? Because <laughs> he just knows it comes in all different forms. And so the thing is, like with him, it's like he, he's got the right motive, like he, he wants some sugar, but he, the, the, what's really driving it is something bad. It's something that we, we don't want him to continue to have sugar. You see, life is full of these ups and downs that we deal with, but throughout the ups and downs, we want to continue to do our best to strive to have a character that reflects Jesus. So as we've been talking through, we've been working through this series called Split, and we're talking about this specific thing, this gap that exists in our character. We're, we're all, we all have different sides. We're all capable of doing good and bad, right and wrong, and, and somewhere in the middle. And that's why we're looking at the life of Peter. Because we see Peter as well. He's literally doing the exact same thing. We see him uh, making the right decisions based on emotions, making the wrong decisions based on emotions. We see this gap in his character. And last week, if you remember, we saw Peter, he had a tendency to be a rule breaker. He kind of did what he wanted. He was brash. He, he made decisions, negative decisions, out of emotion. And today, we're going to see a different side of Peter because he's split. We're going to see a Peter who follows the rules, but a Peter who follows the rules out of the wrong emotion. It ends up going badly for him. We end up looking at a Peter who folds, a Peter who seeks to please others and who flip-flops and lets fear drive. And this is a lot different than the Peter that we just looked at last week. Well, How? Because we all have this tendency to be split. As I said before, we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 11 through 13. Now, if you recall, we had just come out of a series on Galatians called Liberated. So a lot of this information uh, should be fresh to you. You should know the context of where we're coming from here in Galatians. But if not, let me just give you a quick snapshot, okay? Paul writes this letter to the church in Galatia. Okay, and the motivation to write that letter was one primary issue that was happening. You had these Jewish Christians who had been under the Mosaic law for generations. Okay, Jesus comes along and and Jesus, he redefines the law, he fulfills the law, he tells them that things are different, you are justified by faith in me, not through your, your actions and your obedience of the law. Okay, and there's a lot of these Jewish Christians that are in Galatia. Then you also have these Gentile Christians that are in Galatia as well. Now, the Gentile Galatians, they did not follow the law before they came into faith in Jesus Christ. And so what you had happening is you have this this group of Jewish Christians that are telling the Gentiles, hey, you are not just saved uh, through your faith in Jesus. You're not just justified through that. You also have to follow some of the rules of the Old Testament and of the Mosaic law. Now, that was not true. So Paul writes this letter to the church of Galatia, and he's reminding them, hey, look, you are justified by through, you are justified through faith in Jesus, not by your works. That's the primary premise 
of this letter. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of context. So uh, as, we, as we jump into to verse 11 here in chapter 2, let me kind of bring you up to where we are at. Okay, what we see here in the beginning of chapter 2 is we see Paul, Barnabas, and Titus. What they do is they end up going south from Antioch. They come all the way down to Jerusalem, okay? And they have a meeting, a private meeting with Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John, if you recall, they were disciples, Okay, and they were pillars of, of the faith and the church there in Jerusalem. And they go and they have this, this private meeting. It's important to understand that Paul himself, he was not, he was an apostle, but he was not a disciple of Jesus. He came after some of that happened, okay? And so what happens, they have this private meeting, and Peter, James, and John, they bless Paul, and they bless uh, Barnabas and their ministry up in Antioch to the Gentiles, Okay? They, they do what's called, the, they give them the right hand of fellowship. Essentially, they're like shaking forearms or shaking hands. Like they're agreeing that here's what's going to happen. Okay? Paul is going to go back up to Antioch and he's going to minister primarily to, and he's going to reach out to primarily the Gentile community. Okay? And then Peter, he was going to, they agreed that he was going to go and he was going to reach uh, in Antioch primarily uh, the Jewish Christians that were there. Okay? Now, it wasn't exclusive. It wasn't that, hey, you can't talk to these other people groups. It's like, hey, your primary goal, your primary mission here is this people group. So they agree upon this, and Paul goes back to Antioch, and he's doing his thing. He's ministering to, to Gentiles and to, to, to the Jewish Christians, and he's, he's doing his thing, building the church there. And we see uh, Paul and a few others, or excuse me, we see Peter and a few others head up to Antioch. And that's where we kind of jump in here in verse 11. So I'm going to go ahead and read a couple of verses, and then we'll dig in a little deeper. Here's what it says. This is uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And remember, this is Paul writing. You see that he says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, now, Cephas. Let me just stop right there for a second. Okay, so Cephas is Peter. Peter is Simon. Okay, why does this guy have three different names? Is he like bi bipolar? No. Okay, what's going on here is his name, his name is Simon. And in John 1, 42, I believe, 43-ish, um, Jesus changes his name. Okay, he changes his name from Simon to Peter. But Jesus was speaking Aramaic. Okay, and, and he changes his name to the rock or the stone. Okay, now the rock or stone translated in Aramaic is Cephas, okay? But remember, Paul's writing this in Greek, okay? And so when Paul writes this, the word for stone or the word for rock is Peter, okay? So what this is, is Cephas is Peter, okay? He's just using, it's the same name, different language. My middle name is James. In English, that's pronounced James, for those of you who didn't know. In Italian, it's Giacomo, right? Same name, two different languages, okay? So that's all we're dealing with here. So when it refers to Cephas, it's Peter, okay? So this is what it says. It says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Uh, for, before, uh, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Going on to verse 13, it says, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their... Con when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So there's clearly some tension here, right? There's clearly something going on. So let's, let's take a little bit of time here and let's unpack this. Let's see what is happening. So let's look here specifically at verse 11. He says, but when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Okay, so Peter and Paul are in conflict, okay? And they're both apostles, but just because they're apostles does not mean that they don't have conflict. And Paul is taking a bold step here, okay? Remember, he had just had a private meeting where, where, where Peter had, had blessed his ministry, okay? He basically gave him, gave him a, a promotion at work, okay? And he is calling him out, He's calling him out publicly, and he's calling him out in writing, okay? He's doing both of those things. He references, he says, in front of everybody, this is what I said to him, and he's writing about the experience as well. He's, he's taking a brave step here, right? This shows how important the issue was that they were dealing with, that if Paul had to do this. See, Paul was not letting fear stand in the way. He was not allowing uh, people-pleasing. He was not allowing the idea of his new boss, essentially, to, to uh, get in the way of him doing what was right. 
This is like you getting a promotion at work and then sitting in a meeting a few days later in front of half the company and calling out your boss for a mistake. Eh, Not the smartest decision, right? But there was something deep that was happening here that Paul wanted to address that Peter was doing. And last week, we see Peter as the rule breaker, so that's probably what he did, right? He must have broke the rules somewhere. He must have done something wrong. He must have gone rogue and done his whole Peter thing because, like, that's what he does. Actually, on the contrary, that's not what he does. As we look at verse 12, this is what it says. It says, For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, uh, but, they, uh, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Okay, so let's recap just a little bit here. We've got Paul and we've got Barnabas, okay? And they are in, uh, they're in Antioch at this point, and they're ministering to the Gentiles and the Jews, okay? Now, the reason why they're doing that is because Peter, James, and John had blessed this ministry. So then we see Peter come up, and Peter's doing the same thing. His primary uh, people group that he's going after were the Jews. But we see him right here inter- intermingling, right? He's hanging out. He's, he's eating with the Gentiles, okay? They're, they're, they're doing their thing, right? And here's what we see. We see these men from James, okay? Well, essentially what this is, is these are, are Jewish Christians coming up from Jerusalem to Antioch to kind of check on things, see how things are going. And what do we see happen? We see this shift in Peter. He takes this step back from the Gentiles. Why did he do that? Why would he take a step back from the Gentiles? They just had this private meeting, where Peter himself blessed the ministry to the Gentiles, yet he is now finding himself taking a step backwards. He was previously in agreement with it. He previously said, hey, yeah, let's do this. This is a great thing that we should be doing. We should welcome the Gentiles into the church. But he was refusing at this point in time to associate himself with them. Now, there, there's a more serious issue that's taking place. If you know some of the history here about the, the first century Jewish culture, when, when, when people would split a meal together, this was not like you running to Chipotle with your coworker to grab a burrito bowl. That's not what this was, okay? Uh, there were so many meals that, that, that created um, so many different um, staple points as we look through history. There's, there's different harvests that are celebrated. There's different ceremonies that are based on these. And when you ate a meal together, it wasn't grab and go. They would sit down for hours and they would build communion or they would build community and they would have family and it would just be this incredibly deep, enriching, connecting, bonding thing that they would do. And so that's what they're doing. They're eating, okay? And what a lot of scholars believe is this is either called the, the love feast or the agape banquet. This was kind of the church gathering where this took place. And the point of the church gathering was to level the playing field, to level the playing field, to say, hey, we are all equal in the kingdom of God right now, Jews or Gentiles, the popular kids, the unpopular kids. We can all sit at this table in the corner of the cafeteria. Like we are welcome here through Jesus. So there was a lot that was actually happening here, and and, and one of the things that would happen at these meals, at these agape banquets, is that uh, communion was normally taken. And some scholars even believe that Peter went as far as to start denying the Gentiles from taking communion. So this was a big deal. He was taking a huge step backwards. Now, why? Why would Peter do this? It It tells us right here. It says, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. The group, uh, the the circumcision party was essentially the group that had come up from Jerusalem to Antioch. Essentially, these were some of the Jews that believed that you still needed to follow some of these Old Testament um, laws and rituals in order to be accepted into the church. So they were kind of, uh, one of the names for them was the circumcision party, that group of Jews that believed that this is what needed to happen. You see, Peter knew that God was welcoming Gentiles into the church. He knew that, but he let fear stand in the way. He chose to go back and to follow the rules. We've all been in a similar position where we know that there's something right that we should be doing, but we decide to go a different way. You see, we always tend to think that following the rules is the right thing to do, but not when it's the wrong thing to do. And that's what we see happening here. We see him defaulting. We see him start to go into this mode of people pleasing and making decisions out of fear. And my question to you this morning is this, 
What do you do because of fear? What do you do because of fear? What do you not do because of fear? Right? Think about it for a second. Think about the way you treat people. Think, way, think about the ways that you talk to your boss, right? Maybe you're sucking up to your boss all the time and you're, you're, taking, you're taking on projects that you don't need to be taking on because you don't have the time to do them, but you're doing it out of fear because you don't want to lose your job. Think about like your friends, right? Do you have friends that you're afraid to tell something to because you don't trust them? Well, I mean, first and foremost, you need to get different friends if you don't trust them. If you don't trust, they're not your friends if they've got a history of, of showing you that they can't be trusted. But the reality is this, are we afraid to show our true colors? We talk about joining a connect group here all the time. And you have to ask yourself, am I not doing that because of fear? Because I don't, I don't know how people are going to view me. I don't know how people are going to think, uh, what people are going to think once they hear and get to know the real me. Oof, nobody wants to know the real me. I don't want to know the real me, right? What decisions are we making, right? Have you ever thought about maybe going back to school? You ever thought about maybe starting your own business, but fear is standing in the way? Now, let's talk real practical here for just one second. I want to be very clear about something. There's a big difference between uh, fear and wisdom, okay? So we talk about like going out and starting a business. If you leave today and you go and you quit your job because the pastor said I should not do things out of fear, so I'm going to go start this business. I love snow skiing, so I'm going to open up a snow, uh, shop that sells snow skis here in San Diego. Like, yeah, we don't have the biggest market. Like for that, uh, it's probably not the wisest decision that like you could make right? It's really not, okay? There's a difference between fear and wisdom. I've got some friends, they're in the process right now of starting their own business, and, and they're, on the, they're in the process of working on capital and, and getting the knowledge, the understanding. They've got experience in this field. They're doing things right. Is it scary? Absolutely, but they're going about it the wise way, okay? Same thing like with your boss, I'm not telling you to show up to work tomorrow and kick in his door and be like, hey, you big fat jerk, listen, you've been asking me to do like way too much stuff and like I'm putting my foot down. No, uh, that's not wise. Don't do that, okay? Like if you come back next week and you want me to pray for you because that happened, I'm gonna tell you that you're dumb, okay? That's not the best decision to make, okay? Everything in life happens for a reason, Pastor Dan. Yeah, I know, and sometimes it's because we're stupid and make bad decisions. Don't make an unwise decision. That's not what I'm telling you, Okay? I'm telling you to, to learn to figure out, to learn to decipher the difference between fear and wisdom. And how do you do that? How do you seek wisdom? Through prayer, through the reading of God's word, and through seeking wise counsel from other mature believers in the faith. That's how you seek wisdom. That's how you learn to understand the difference between making a decision out of wisdom or fear, right? That's the difference. So what is causing what is fear causing you to do? What is it causing you to not do? Are you making fear-based decisions? You see, our decisions, uh, whether large or small, they've got an implication larger than we always think. There's always a ripple effect when it comes to our decisions because we have influence. Each and every one of us, whether it be small or whether it be large, we all have influence. Whether you're a stay-at-home parent, okay, whether you've got employees, whether you've got friends, whether you've got followers on social media, employees, whatever the case may be, you have influence. John Maxwell, he says that leadership is influence. And so what does that mean? That means that if you've got influence of any sort, that you are a leader. And as leaders, if we make fear-based decisions, we have to know and understand that it's going to impact those who we are influencing, those who follow us without uh, our, our knowledge even sometimes. And the same happened with Peter. Let's look at uh, verse 13 here. It says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So Peter knew. He absolutely knew that the Jews that were coming up to Antioch from Jerusalem, he knew that they were going to have a problem with him associating himself with Gentiles. He knew that that was going to happen, right? And so what happens is, is we see him take this step back and his decision has influence. You see, for over a thousand years, the Jews and the Gentiles had been segregated. They'd been segregated, and so the church had been working so hard to, to co-mingle, to remind everybody that, look, under faith in Jesus, we are all one. We are all equal. See, to these Jewish Christians that were coming up from Jerusalem to Antioch, they didn't even believe that these Gentiles, they didn't even view them as Christians because they weren't following some of the, the Old Testament law. 
So what do we see happen? We see, picture like a middle school cafeteria, right? And you've got, you've got all the popular kids, you've got all the unpopular kids. And you see one of the popular kids start taking a step back from all the unpopular kids. And then all the other popular kids start doing the exact same thing. That's exactly what is taking place here. See, Peter clearly had influence. Clearly he had influence. And so what he does is to avoid conflict out of fear of the circumcision party, out of fear of people pleasing what they might think of him, he takes this step away from the Gentiles. And a bunch of the, the Jewish Christians start to follow. They start to do the exact same thing. And then look at what it says here. It says, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Barnabas, remember, he was one of the ones that was with Paul in the first place that Peter, James, and John blessed their ministry and told them, go and minister to the Gentiles. Even Barnabas takes a step back from this community and says, wait, let me just associate myself here with just the Jewish Christians. This is a big deal. This is why Paul calls him out. This is exactly why Paul calls him out in person and in writing. It's because there was more at stake here than just a meal. So much more at stake. This was the gospel. This is what they had been working toward, toward building one church outside of any ethnicity, outside of any, uh, any of these different cultural guidelines. They were trying to build a church. You see, there was a gap there. There was a gap between who the church was in that moment and who Jesus was calling the church to be. And Paul recognized this gap and calls out Peter. We have to understand that that our fear, it affects others. Our fear, it affects others. It's easy for us to look at this story and to, to criticize Peter. But we all know what it means to make a decision like this. We all know what it means to make a decision that's motivated by fear, motivated by trying to please other people. Everybody knows what it feels like to try to do something right, have the right intentions, but still have the actions fall flat. Like we've been saying, this is an issue that we all have. We all have this character issue. There's this gap between who we are and who Jesus called us to be. And fear is part of that gap. There's a lot of different areas in our character. But fear is a big one. This is what it says. The, the phrase, um, uh, you know, do not be afraid, something of that uh, effect. We find that in the Bible over 150 times. Something that says, uh, you know, uh, God talks about fear of do not fear, do not be anxious, have no fee- fear, be without fear. All of these other things. It's so easy to talk about it. But when we're in the middle of it, it's much harder to actually apply. But one verse that, that just pops out as we were, we were studying through this is Isaiah 41.10. It says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Are you driven by fear this morning? In what areas of your life are you allowing fear to drive your decision making. You see, we are all split. We're all capable of making decisions that we shouldn't make. We're all, we're all capable of allowing those emotions that we have to drive who we are and what we do. But through all that, that's, that's where we should recognize our need for Jesus. In those moments, when we look at that gap in our lives, no matter how big or how small that gap may be between who we are and who Jesus has called us to be, we need to understand that Jesus is going to be the one to get us there. We had the opportunity last week to see uh, Peter as a rule breaker. This morning we looked at at how uh, Peter has been a rule follower as well, and it didn't work out for him because in both of these circumstances it was motivated by something else. Here's what I want to do. I want to encourage each and every one of you to come back next week because next week we're going to be looking at at another side of Peter. We're going to be seeing Peter at his best it's when he's, he's recklessly just following Jesus, and we see uh, true life come through Peter as he follows Jesus. And and our hope and our prayer is that each and every one of us would learn to do the exact same thing. So we'll see you guys here for that next week. Will you go ahead and do me a favor? Go ahead and bow your heads with me as I pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for speaking to us, God, through the, the, the dysfunctional parts of Peter. God, we're just so thankful 
that we get to look at this and we get to see your mighty hand at work. God, I pray that no matter where we find ourselves this morning, whether we would uh, resonate as a rule follower, whether we would resonate as a rule breaker, God, whether we see ourselves as as having a, a large gap in our character or a small gap in our character, God, we pray that you would be the only thing that we would continue to look to as we try to live a life that reflects you. Maybe you're, maybe you're here this morning and you've never, uh, you've never decided to, to, to follow Jesus with your whole life, with your whole heart. If that's you this morning, I just want to encourage you, just say this prayer uh, after me in your own words, in the silence and stillness of your own heart. Just say, God, forgive me. God, I need you in my life. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. And I ask right now that you would be the Lord of my life. I ask God that you would help me to fill this gap in my character, Lord. That I could learn to live a life that glorifies you and pleases you. God, I pray that as we all uh, come back here next week safely, God, that you would just keep our, our hearts open, our minds open to what it is that you would have for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask these things in your name. Everybody said, amen.